This film was made in the year 2003. As a new millennium dawns for planet Earth, we look back on the events which finally unlocked a mystery that has haunted humankind since time began. July 2001, radio astronomers from the SETI Society, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, were combing the sky for signs of alien life. Armed with radio telescopes, SETI scientists scanned the vast reaches of space, hoping to detect a deliberate signal of some kind amid all the cosmic noise. Senior scientist Professor Jane Lascelles a radio telescope basically works like an enormous antenna and it uh, is searching the galaxy for radio waves and um, these radio waves are caused by an enormous number of naturally occurring phenomenon but the search for extraterrestrial intelligence focuses on radio signals that are not naturally occurring that are being obviously deliberately transmitted and um, that could only be you know, intelligent life forms on another planet, um, aliens, if you will. On July the 23rd, the SETI astronomers were just beginning a new space survey based at Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia. Signal engineer Dr. Don Merrick was working at the telescope in the early hours of the morning. I remember that it was uh, very late. It was about 3 a.m. Uh, we had just repositioned the telescope and uh, I got a, a peek out of the noise uh, signal coming through on my, my station. Um, now, this is not so unusual. It happens, you know, fairly often. The standard procedure is to confirm it with another telescope. Merrick contacted fellow astronomers in Massachusetts. Now, two sets of scientists were tuned into the same frequency. And it was about a half hour later, I got an email that said something like, uh, what the hell is that? And, um, you know, and that's when I knew that we had something remarkable. They knew the signal had to be taken seriously and began standard tests to make sure it was genuine. They moved their telescopes away from the frequency and the signal disappeared. They brought them back and the signal returned. Then the computers were checked for faults. Everything was working. At that point, I contacted my colleagues, and they contacted the Owens Valley Observatory in California and the Arecibo uh, Telescope in Puerto Rico, which is the largest in the world. Um, we asked them to tune into the same frequency, and uh, the information came back positive. They, uh, they had the same signal. And I hadn't slept in days, and I was uh, wide awake, I can tell you that. With three different telescopes receiving the same signal from the same point in the sky, and showing no natural characteristics, astronomers were convinced the message was extraterrestrial. Email went out to the top scientists in the field, but no one knew what the signal was saying. None of the telescopes were sensitive enough to read it clearly. The scientists were reluctant to go public with their news, but events were already overtaking them. I think that under ideal circumstances, we would have worked on that signal for some time. But within a few days, the news leaked out. And as you know, in the computer age, it's virtually impossible to keep anything a secret. One of the most startling discoveries of the century. And the source of the leak was two computer hackers in San Francisco who'd entered a local university network. An avalanche of email among astronomers was their clue that something was up. We were hacking into these university internet accounts, reading their emails, and we came across this string of messages between these radio astronomers. And these guys were jazzed about something. I, I didn't know what they were talking about. So I took these messages and I propagated them across the internet into different web pages. I know the scientific community says they intended all along to give the public this information, but I don't buy it. You know, these guys, politicians, scientists, they've lied to us before. They'll lie to us again. They're not about to stop.
As soon as the hackers began spreading the email around the internet, it was picked up by the military. A short time later, SETI astronomer Ben Klatsky received a call from the Pentagon. When they first called, uh, they said that they'd heard that we'd received some interesting signals and asked if we were willing to confirm. All pretty low-key. And then they wanted to know, uh, did we know how far away the signals were coming from? And if they were coming from something moving, uh, say a spaceship. I'm sure national security was their concern. But I told them just to relax and wait for our press conference. The astronomers knew they had to go public fast with their discovery, or someone else would. But as Greg Silverman found out, the military was already way ahead of them. At exactly 6 o'clock on the Monday morning, we lost our signal to interference completely. We were wiped out. Yeah, at first we thought it was just a problem with the telescope, then we started calling around and we found out it had happened to everybody. As it turned out, the military had managed to jam that particular frequency for every single radio telescope in the world. On August the 5th, 2001, with the U.S. military in a state of high alert, it fell to Professor Jane Lascelles to inform the world of their historic discovery. I think that day gave all of us pretty strange feeling. You know, every other great revolution in human knowledge is spread gradually through society. But here we were, in the age of instant communications, walking out and saying to the world, hey guys, we've got some news that changes everything. Astronomers from the SETI Society, working at the Green Bank Observatory, West Virginia, identified a radio signal which they had reason to believe originated from an extraterrestrial technology. There was instant bedlam. Lascelles struggled to continue. The signal originates from Gliese 1116, a double star system, 17 light years. Information Lascelles managed to explain that the other observatories had been given sufficient information to undertake their own research into the weak and distant signal. But the journalists had little interest in the scientific protocol. They wanted headlines. And the first question they asked Don Merrick was why the signal hadn't been decoded. The signal itself? is actually quite weak. Um, what that means is that we're going to have to build some more telescopes, uh, at least one, probably uh, several dozen, dozens maybe, in order to properly receive the signal. Uh, this is going to take some time and depends on funding, actually. Um, it, and, and at that point, we'll be able to begin decoding the messages. And then came the first signs of panic. Dr. Merrick. Yes. How do you know that the aliens are not headed this way right now? There is no danger of that whatsoever. It, we cruise the solar system in our spacecraft at about 36,000 miles per hour. So um, they may be able to travel faster than us, but, but even at the speed of light, it would take them 17 years. So you've got this signal that you're not receiving properly. You can't decode it. Do you really expect the public to believe you? Even while the press conference was still taking place, telescopes of every kind all over the world were turning to the same point in the sky. In the face of fierce international protest, the U.S. military had now turned off their jamming device. But even then, only a very few telescopes were powerful enough to pick up the signal and separate it from all the surrounding noise. As the news began to spread, people reacted with amazement and delight. Tonight on KBTV World News, Scientists say E.T. is calling. I was shocked. I read it in the paper this morning. You did? Yes. And you feel shocked? Yes, I am. <laughs> Why are you so shocked? I, I'm just shocked that it happened. I mean, to read that, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I didn't even know anything was going on. Yeah, I believe that, that discovering that the possibility of other people in this universe will, uh, will make us realize that we are not the only people or things here and make us really what we are, a small part of a very big 
universe. Actually, I'd always thought that there were some intelligent beings out there. I mean, I wanted to know what makes us think that we're so superior, that we're the only ones here. It's glad. I'm glad to hear that. But the financial community was not nearly so upbeat. Wall Street had its worst day since the crash of 87, plunging a free-falling 596 points. Concerned, but not alarmed, at the unusual amount of activity they experienced after yesterday's historic announcement. Although there was a surge in withdrawals from... The scientists became celebrities overnight. We're going to have to get used to that other strange monster, the press pack. And the question all these journalists are asking is, just who and what are these alien creatures? Despite the astronomers' insistence that the signal had come from trillions of miles away, many reports gave the impression aliens would be arriving any minute. The media was obsessed with what the creatures might look like. But above all, they wanted to know, was the Earth in danger? How do you defend against an extraterrestrial attack? The answer might lie with the Star Wars technology developed in the 1980s to counter Soviet nuclear missiles. If the lasers from this satellite defense were turned outward towards space, might they be able to counter any extraterrestrial attack? Over the days that followed, there was growing evidence of confusion and misunderstanding among the public and the press. Reports of UFOs and alien contacts soared. I could see the little legs on it, like little pods on the bottom. It was a saucer-shaped deal. I've seen it. I know what I've seen. I'm a believer in it. A number of doctors and psychologists today expressed concern about the possible destabilizing effects the discovery of aliens might have upon people they consider psychologically susceptible. One of the journalists who attended SETI's press conference was Cheryl Davis, a freelance writer with a special interest in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Davis recalls what happened when she returned home on the evening of the astronomer's announcement. I remember that night. I'd just been given this monumental news and the world just seemed so normal to me. I guess I just figured that when we finally contacted alien life from outer space, they would just come right down to the White House and plant themselves on the lawn. So I come in, I'm on this daze from this press conference, and I'm listening to my answering machine, and there's this one really bizarre one. I kept it. It was so strange. I mean, he talked about Roswell. Maybe it's time to think about Roswell again, Miss Davis. Davis knew Roswell as a town where some people claimed a UFO had crash-landed back in 1947. She was also aware that the U.S. Air Force had recently offered an explanation for what had really happened at Roswell all those years ago. They said the supposed UFO had actually been a crashed surveillance balloon from a secret program known as Project Mogul. Davis immediately contacted Bill Gregory, a journalist who had worked on the Mogul story, and reported her phone message. You know, whenever you heard anything that came out of Roswell, it was usually some crazy theory about aliens or a UFO sighting. But when Cheryl called me about a signal, plus what I'd been reading in the Mogul report, I thought, maybe I had to take one more look down here. Gregory knew that the top secret Project Mogul had operated from Holloman Air Force Base about 150 miles from Roswell. He soon discovered that one of the project's research engineers was still alive and living in the area. His name was Walter Drexler. None of us engineers really knew what was going on exactly, uh, but I knew there was a infrared sensor on board, and uh, if the test worked, we'd have one of those balloons uh, along the border of the Soviet Union. Maybe it would uh, detect a nuclear missile test or something like that. According to Drexler, the balloon must have detected something the military wanted to keep top secret. I heard that the balloon had crashed, and uh, I figured uh, it must have picked up something before it crashed, because the base went on a 